Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our lunch here today. Um, I'd like to start by welcoming our speaker, Mr. Roberto Alvo, Chief Corporate Officer of LATAM Airlines Group. Roberto joined LAN in 2001, served in a number of leadership positions since then, including Senior VP Strategic Planning and Development, CFO of LAN Argentina, and Vice President of the Treasury. Before 2001, he held various positions with Sociedad, my apologies, I have difficulty with the Spanish, Sociedad Chimica y Menera de Chile SA, a leading non-metallic Chilean mining company. Roberto is a civil engineer, and he obtained his MBA from IMD, Institute of Management Development in Lausanne, Switzerland. Ladies and gentlemen, please re welcome our good friend, Roberto Alvo. Good afternoon to you all. Um, and before I talk about the merger a little bit and start, I just want to do some, something here. I, I, I was asked to bring a gift for door prize, but you know, the good friends at Boeing came at some point in time with the idea of doing a dual library 787. But Rex Gallard and Eric Hill from Boeing actually came up with this. There's only 10 of these in the world, only 10 made. So I'm happy to donate this airplane for the silent auction at the gala dinner in October, in October is it, no? This year. Uh, so I'd like to thank Boeing for the idea of this, and I'd like to thank also Barry for allowing me to do that. So I'm actually thanking Airbus at Boeing at the same time, which is kind of unique. I hope that's on tape. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> let me talk a little bit about the merger, but I'm going to try to give it a slightly different twist that the normal, but before talking about it, um, probably some of you are not so well acquainted with South America and its aviation history, so I'll just spend a couple of minutes talking about TAM and LAN and, and, and what, what's been the industry in the last 12 years. TAM is a rel relatively new airline. It was born in 1976 as a very small regional carrier. TAM stands for Transportes Aéreos Marilia. Marilia is a very small city in, in, in the Sao Paulo region. Um, it grew very quickly domestically, but it only launched its first international flight in 1998. And from there, until prior to the merger, it became one of the 25 largest airlines in the world. LAN on the other side is an old airline. It was started in 1929, was stayed on for many, many years, privatized in the early 90s. The current controlling group of LAN, of LATAM, is the same controlling group of LAN back in 1994. And LAN has a very special history because it was started from a very small country in a very poor geographical position from an airline perspective, very far away. The only thing behind us is penguins. And um, it didn't have actually the right to be what it is because we had absolutely no strategic advantage to make inroads into this industry. We realized that early and uh, in the late 90s, land decided to, to expand from Chile, enter Peru in 1999, Ecuador in 2003, Argentina in 2005, and with the acquisition of Aires in Colombia in 2010, when we announced the merger right after that, and we became one of the largest airline groups in the world. And this happened, the growth of these two airlines, happened in a context of very high growth in South America as well. And also a very important change in the model of aviation in South America. If you recall yourself to the early parts of this century, and think about the names of airlines that used to fly in the region. Most of them state-owned or heavily state-subsidized or controlled by employees, as in the case of Varig. Um, the names you know, those airlines were replaced by a completely new set of companies that were much more efficient in terms of its administration, better capitalized with new airplanes, um, and the model of public companies switch to a model of fully privatized companies, so with the exception of a couple examples today, the South American aviation industry is fully private. And at the same time, two more changes happened in South America. First was an important degradation of the skies. Back in the year 2000, South America only had signed 15, <coughs> 1, 5, 15 open skies agreements, whether it was among themselves or with other airlines outside of South America. That number today is 112, so almost an eight-fold increase over 20 years. And this happened in a context of very high economic expansion for the region. The GDP per capita of 
the countries in South America doubled almost in 12 years. And if you add the increase in, pop in population the, of the region, the economies actually grew by 150%. And at that same time, the airline industry grew its quantity of passengers by four times. So we are now um, four times the passenger that used to travel in the year 2000 travel today. So this is a context of how the industry and the companies evolved by the time we came to the merger. We announced it 22 months, we closed it 22 months ago. And today, LATAM is the 11th largest company in the world by number of passengers transported, the 12th largest by terms of ASKs. And it's also the 11th largest in terms of ATKs, cargo, uh, ATKs, cargo tons transport. So we are 11 and 11, and there's only five companies in the world that can claim being one of the 11 largest on both passengers and cargo. You have KLM of France and Lufthansa from Europe, uh, China Eastern and Air China from China, and Latam. Of course, if you count ASKs, not passengers transported, we will add Emirates to the mix. But uh, no US carrier actually is in that list. So out of 6% of the world traffic, that's how much Latin America waits in the airline industry, we've been able to grow a company that's among the top 12 airlines in size in the world. But size for us is not important on, a, on an absolute basis. What's important is the presence and what it implies for us in South America. Today we are in seven home markets, we call them home markets, different countries where we have domestic operations. Those seven markets comprise 94% of the traffic within South America. The only relevant economy where we don't have a domestic operation today is Venezuela. We are a leader in those markets. We are leader in 80% of that 94% of traffic. And we are three times larger, whether it's measured on revenues or ASKs than our next competitor in the region and we have more than two times the number of destinations that any other carrier in South America. Today we fly more than 40% of the passengers that fly domestically within South America, and almost one of every two passengers that fly internationally within South America. So giving you that context, let me, let me tell you in which ways we think that the merger is important. And I'm not gonna talk about the fact that of course we have a better standing of competing with the largest carriers outside that have merged, because that's obvious. I think that there's two, two aspects on where I think it's important to think about why the merger uh, makes a change. First is for the industry as a whole. I think that um, M&A activity in the, in, in, in the US showed us how two, American, two, two carriers from a same market can merge, consolidate, and even merge the AOCs. I think that what we've seen in Europe, it's a combination of airlines of different countries, but under a very uh, equal set of rules, and in a different state where not necessarily the operations have merged, but it's mostly companies that have an umbrella of ownership under the other carriers. But LATAM is the only, the first, we believe, true cross-border merging that happened in the aviation history so far uh, in, a, in a large scale. And we've done that in, an, in, an, in, a, in a very highly regulated environment. We not only had to comply with very stringent securities, antitrust, tax um, restrictions, also it had to be compatible with the interest of both controlling shareholders of LAN and TAM. But most importantly, it allowed us to operate two airlines, or seven airlines, I should say, because all the LAN uh, subsidiaries are also airlines, as one company from an operational perspective, despite of us having important ownership, foreign ownership restrictions in Brazil. Today, you cannot have more than 20% of the voting stock of a, an airline if you're a foreign in Brazil. And we believe that that's an important present for what it may come in the future. Um, there's a very well-known analyst that follows the airline industry, Mike Lindenberg, you probably know him. And I just grabbed a sentence from one of his reports back in 2011 prior to us completing the merger that talks about what this means. He said, over the past year or so, we have seen Latin American airlines not only embrace consolidation, but structure some of the industry's most innovative transactions. In that regard, the proposed merger between LAN and TAM could be a future model for how to do a cross-border merger despite very restrictive ownership laws. We view this as a very innovative transaction and potentially a template to be used by other airlines considering cross-border mergers. And, um, I'm not gonna guess where it can come from. I see that there's potential in other regions and even uh, consolidation across regions. I think that's one of the trends we'll look at as we go down the line. 
So I think that's one angle on where the merger, it's uh, interesting to see. But most importantly, it's important for us. And to tell you why it's important for us, let me, let, let me, let me reflect on what we think is going to happen in South America in the next few years. So whether you take Airbus or Boeing or IATA um, projections on traffic growth, Latin America stands as, together with the Middle East, as the two, the two the regions that will grow the most. And depending on the report you see, you see growth of 6 to 7%, which means doubling the size of the industry over a period of 10 or 12 years. And why this is happening, or why will it happen? Because flying is still relatively exclusive in South America. In Chile, domestic, uh, the domestic business unit tra tracks uh, a, a KPI, which is the percentage of different people that have flown over the past 18 months with us. And back in 2005, that number was 8%. So that means that 92% of Chileans out of the 17 million had not taken a plane in the 18 months prior to that measure. That's 2005, we measure this every year. The number for 2013 stands at 20%. So still four out of five, every, of five Chileans don't fly or haven't flown in the past 18 months and probably haven't flown at all. And Chile has today the highest per capita trips of any Latin American country. Today, you have approximately one passenger per inhabitant in Chile, so 17 million people, 17 million flights. But Colombia is under 0.5, Brazil is right under 0.6, Peru is under 0.5. So I don't have that percentage of people, KPI for those countries, but you can imagine it's probably around 10%. So that means that there's a huge number of people, a large pool of population that still have not tried traveling. But to give numbers to this, I, I like to, to use these figures to compare a little bit to, to what the US is today. In the US we have 310 million people, 9.6 million square kilometers. And according to FAA, last year, approximately 650 million domestic flights. If you add all the domestic flights of all the individual countries in South America to the international flights within the region, as to count it as if it was a country, it's only 161 million for 2013. So that's over a population of 400 million people. So that's actually one quarter of the flights that you have in the US with 30% more population. That means that this industry is still very immature in Latin America. So let me come back to the merger now. The way we like to see this is that if you think about Europe, if you think about the US, at the time their industries were immature, 30, 40 years ago, there was not a single carrier that was able to take a leadership position when those industries had high growth potential. Uh, everybody saw the opportunity. You had, in the case of Europe, probably airlines more related to countries. In the case of the US, probably more related to regions or cities. But all of these carriers saw the opportunity of getting a, a place of leadership in a very high growth environment. What happened is lots of carriers, a lot of added capacity in time, poor financial performance, and at the end, after many years, consolidation. We've achieved consolidation in South America at a time when the industry is still immature with high growth rates. And we think that that changes very much the dynamics of the South American airline industry going forward. So we don't see a trend than the one we've seen in Europe and the US. And sitting from a leadership perspective in this high growth environment, we believe it provides us with unique opportunities to do stuff that no other airlines have been able to do within a region before. The fact that we have operations in almost all of these countries and the connectivity that we can provide, opening new travel alternatives for the 400 million people that live in South America and the almost 50 million people that visit South America every year, we think is unparalleled. And in that sense, we believe that we've created a company that has the ability of lead a, a market that still has a huge potential of growing. That gap between 161 million passengers and 650 million passengers in the US, if we just close the gap by half, that means that in the next, which is doubling the size of the industry today, that means that depending on the size of the airplane you think about, the region will require just for growth between 700 and 1,000 
wide, uh, single body, single aisle airplanes. And therefore, what we like uh, when we think about the merger is exactly the, the possibility of being in this leadership position at a time of where the industry is still very mature. And we see probably 20 years of very healthy growth in South America. So that's what I want to talk about the merger. I heard a few people asking me about a couple more things, how the merger is going, and also about the World Cup. <laughs> so let me, let me talk about the merger first and then the World Cup. It's been 22 months since we merged. Um, I think it's, there's no way of planning, no matter how much planning you do ahead of such a big transaction to make sure that everything's going to be right. It's a very complex endeavor. We've, be, we've achieved in 22 months many things. We've integrated completely all the corporate areas of the company. We just completed a couple months ago the complete new organizational chart of the company. We believe now that we have the right organization for what's coming uh, along further. We still uh, have many challenges integrating processes and systems. But most importantly, we have provided our passengers, our clients, with a complete new set of connectivity opportunities. Now, passengers within South America can do things that in the past would require them to fly to other regions to get there. But we still have a very important challenge and we are lagging far behind in making our passengers feel that they fly in one airline. LAN, as it had to grow from Chile in the early days of this century, at some point in time realized that they needed to give a one single customer experience to the passengers regardless of they were flying. So a passenger that could be flying between Guayaquil and Quito in Ecuador had to feel exactly the same customer experience that a passenger that flew between Buenos Aires and Bariloche in Argentina. We did achieve that at LAN, uh, and it took not, a, not so long time to do it, but I think that we still owe, and the most important thing we haven't done in the merger is to provide our customers with an improved single experience so that they could take any LAN or TAM flight and feel that they're flying in the same airline. And I think that's our biggest challenge going forward. It requires training and changing processes in over 50,000 people. That's a pretty big job. So believe me, I've been in this merger for two years. It's a great experience, but it's a once in a lifetime thing. I don't want to do it again. <laughs> Finally, uh, let me talk about the World Cup. I've, lots of people talk, ask me about that. This is going to be the World Cup of air travel. Brazil is a huge country, and uh, 12 cities will host the games. Some of those cities are far away, very isolated, um, and the infrastructure, whether it's rail or cars, for, for accessing those cities is relatively underdeveloped. So it's going to be our responsibility at the end of the day of transporting lots of people from one place to another. And let me just give you an example with numbers to see how show you how the size of the challenge is. There's a city in the north called Fortaleza. You've probably heard about it, Northeast. It's a city of approximately 2.5 million people. Brazil, the host team, will play in Fortaleza against Mexico. The city itself has a stadium for 47,000 people and uh, only 17,000 hotel beds. Many Fortalesians are lending their apartments to people from outside of the city that want to watch the game. You can bet that 198 million Brazilians out of the 200 that taking out the 200 that live in Fortaleza want to go to that game. And I want to be there in a very small span of time. Most of them will probably try to go just for the game and come back because of lack of lodging. So transporting 17 or probably more, 25,000 people requires 100, 100, 100 to 150 flights to be done in a very small, amount of time to an airport that normally receives 40 flights a day. Then you have to do something with the airplanes because you have only 24 parking slots at the airport. And you have to wait for the game to end, hopefully good for Brazil, and then bring them back. Uh, and on top of that, that region has not very good weather during July and June. Uh, so it's going to be a very challenging endeavor to make uh, this thing happen. You know, you talk to other airlines that have hosted similar events, and your common sense tells you that it's great for airlines to be in such a large event. It is not. First, uh, um, business travel tends to stay away from these things. The government of Brazil decided 
to make a national holiday the day when Brazil plays, but also decided to make a city holiday whenever two teams play in a specific city. You have 52 games spanning over 30 days, 22 working days. Uh, so the impact on business travel, we believe, will be substantial because many of these cities will be on holidays. If Brazil goes to the final, that's seven games. So that's seven national holidays in a month. <laughs> Good for Brazilians, <laughs> but for business. So um, I think it's going to be a, a fine World Cup, but it's definitely going to be a very stringent test for us and all the other airlines that operate in the region. It's not going to be an easy endeavor. But uh, if, you like, if you like soccer, I, I hope to see you there. Otherwise, watch on TV. Well, thank you very much. So we have a few moments for questions. So uh, I, I, my, my apologies, Roberto. I'm sure we have a number of people who would like to ask you some more questions about which team is actually going to win the World Cup. I'm going to offer commentary, not question. About two weeks ago, my son and I we're on our way to your country, to Santiago, Chile. And we boarded LAN, the 787. And I have to tell all of you here that it was like a dream walking into that airplane. It is so magnificent, so quiet, so wonderful, <laughs> that I have never, ever in all my years since 1962 had such a wonderful experience. The service, <laughs> the service on LAN is extraordinary, just as the hospitality is in Chile, and the airplane was just beyond belief. So I want everyone in this room, should they have the opportunity, I would suggest they take this airplane with this airline. That's a very good question. The question was, how long do we intend to keep both brands? It's a very difficult question. It's a very, it has very large trade-offs. On the one side, um, you think about having one single brand that can globally compete against the largest airlines, and that's important and it's appealing. But on the other side, you have very well-established brands that are very powerful in the countries where they operate. And neither of the two brands, whether it's TAM on the Pacific side, where LAN currently or originally operates, or LAN on the Brazilian side, Neither of those brands is important in the other country. So uh, we have not yet made a decision if we will keep both brands or not. It's a, it's a very complicated question. We're actually looking into that in these upcoming months, uh, but I'm not sure what's going to happen. It's, uh, it's, it's going to be interesting. Uh, Venezuela has been a problem country uh, down in, in that area. It's uh, frozen cash, a uh, number of airlines. I'm uh, not sure exactly you know, when you're going to get it and, you know, how much. Just what, what's, how exposed are you to, uh, to Venezuela and what do you think is going to play out there? The situation in Venezuela is complex for the industry. Um, you probably know the whole industry has approximately $3.7 billion that has not been able to recover uh, from, from revenues in Venezuela. Uh, in the case of LATAM, um, we have approximately $140 million dollars. Uh, today in, in the country. Other, there are other larger airlines that have uh, a high, higher exposure. We are working with the government in looking at ways of finding a solution, but uh, to the date, it's still unclear on how this will play out. You've had an enviable growth record, but of late it's slowed, like much of Latin America. How do you see your capacity and your growth trajectory going forward, and how are you managing the two? I think you have to look at Brazil differently than the rest of the, of the region. Brazil, since 2004 or 2005, um, and after the demise of VARIC, grew domestically at an extraordinarily high rate. Um, and it came in a time when the real was appreciating, so the currency was stronger, and that meant, low, meant lower cost for domestic operators in Brazil. So with a little bit of headwinds, both uh, Tam and Go, and, and, and uh, particularly them, were very aggressive in growing. But that trend changed uh, when Brazil slowed down economically. Uh, Brazil grew at 7.2% in 2010. It grew just barely above 2% in 2013. Uh, and we realized right after the merger that it was very important to bring uh, supply down and create a sense of capacity discipline in the market. Yields 
in past years from 2005 to 2011 fell substantially and uh, the industry was not in a, in a state of um, tranquility at all. Going forward, and, 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 the, and therefore we decreased our operation in Brazil, we decreased it 9%. Domestically, gold did something similar. And Azul and Avianca actually slowed down their pace of growth substantially as well. Uh, now we think that the capacity that is put there is more or less in line with what the market requires. But Brazil is going to grow in, in the medium long term. Again, the figures about people flying are very low. The potential for Brazilians to, as just as they came from the lower classes into the middle class and the numbers are staggering, lower class people 10 years ago was 40% of population, today it's under 20%. Um, this will imply that there's uh, an important push for demand going forward. But uh, we thought that uh, the market needed to strain a little bit and come back and make sure that the right place, it was in the right place to, to start growing again. The other countries in the region uh, fare much better. They have much more stable dynamics going forward. Um, the countries in the Pacific have grown in terms of capacity and traffic at double digits in the past five or six years. Uh, we don't think that that's going to be the trend for the following years, but high single digits, we think it's attainable. Well, thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Roberto. I want to make the uh, usual presentation uh, to Roberto. We have a little plaque which reads, presented to Roberto Alvo in grateful appreciation for your presentation at the Aviation Leader Series of the Wings Club, New York City, April 2014.